chapters seven and eight of and then the town took off by richard wilson this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by tom weiss chapter seven miss leora frisbee spinster was found dead in the mushroom cellar of her home on ryder avenue in the northeastern part of town she had been sitting in a camp chair bundled in heavy clothing when she died she had been subject to heart trouble and that fact coupled with notes she had been making on a pad in her lap led the coroner to believe she had been frightened to death the first entry on the pad said someone stealing my mushrooms must keep vigil the notes continued sitting in chair near stairs single sixty watt bulb dims gravity increases superior rising again movement in corner soil being pushed up from underneath hand hand claw claw withdraws head rat no bigger human no but the eyes eyes i that was all photostatic copies of the late miss frisbee's notes and the coroner's report became exhibits one and two in doc bendy's dossier exhibit three was a carbon copy of a report by the stock control clerk at the bubblegum factory bubblegum had been piling up in the warehouse and on the railroad siding back of riley street the stock control clerk armand speck was taking inventory when he saw a movement at the far end of the warehouse his report follows investigated and found carton had been dislodged from top of pile and broken into gross of cheeky brand missing saw something sitting with back to me opening packages stuffing gum into mouth wax paper and all half dozen at time looked like overgrown chimpanzee it turned and saw me continuing to chew didn't get clear look before it disappeared but noticed two things one that its cheeks bulged out from chewing so much gum at once and another that its eyes were round and bright even in dim corner then animal turned and disappeared behind pile of cheekies no chimpanzee didn't follow right away but when i did it was gone exhibit four dear diary there wasn't any t v tonight and i asked grandfather bendy what to do and he said marie when i was young boys and girls made their own fun and so i got out the scrabble and asked mom and dad to play but they said no they had to go to warner's and play bridge so they went and i was playing pretending i was both sides when the door opened and i said hello grandfather but it wasn't him it was like a kangaroo and it had big eyes that were friendly after a while i went over and scratched its ears and it liked that and then it went over to the table and looked at the scrabble i thought wouldn't it be funny if it could play but it couldn't but it could spell it had hands like claws with long black fingernails and fur on them the fingers and it pushed the letters around so they spelled name and i spelled out marie then i spelled out who are you and it spelled g i z l then i spelled how old are you and it put all the blank spaces together i said where do you live and it spelled here then i changed to where do you come from and it pointed to the blanks again the gizzle went away before mom and dad came home and i didn't tell them about it but i'll tell grandfather bendy because he understands better about things like the time i had an invisible friend don court went to bed in the dormitory at cavalier with a surprised realization that it had been only twenty-four hours since superior took off it seemed more like a week when he woke up the floating town was over new york some high-flying skywriters were at work welcome superior drink pepsi cola their message said don dressed quickly and hurried to the brink alice garrett was there among a little crowd bundled up in a parka is that the hudson river she asked him where's the empire state building yes he said haven't you ever been to new york i can't quite make it out it's somewhere south of that patch of green that central park no i've never been out of ohio i thought new york was a big city it's big enough don't forget we're four miles up have you seen any planes besides the skywriters just some airliners way down she said were you expecting someone seeing how it's our last port of call 
I thought there might be some Federal boys flying around. I shouldn't think they'd want a chunk of their real estate exported to Europe. Are we going to Europe? Bound to, if we don't change course. Why? My very next words were going to be, don't ask me why. I ask you. You're closer to the horse's mouth than I am. If you mean father, Alice said, I told you I don't enjoy his confidence. Have you even got an inkling of what he's up to? I'm sure he's not the mastermind, if that's what you mean. Then who is? Ruback? Civic? The chief of police? Or the bubblegum king, whoever he is? Cheeky McPherson? She laughed. I went to grade school with him, and if he's got a mind, I never noticed it. McPherson? He's just a kid, isn't he? His father died a couple of years ago, and Cheeky's the president on paper, but the business office runs things. We call him Cheeky because he always had a wad of company gum in his cheek, supposed to be an advertisement, but he never gave me any, and I always chewed Wrigley's for spite. Oh, Don chewed the inside of his own cheek and watched the coastline. That's Connecticut now, he said. We're certainly not slowing down for customs. A speck trailing vapor through the cold upper air headed toward them from the general direction of New England. As it came closer, Don saw that it was a B-58 Hustler bomber. He recognized it by the mysterious pod it carried under its body, three-quarters as long as the fuselage. It's not going to shoot us down, is it? Alice asked. Hardly. I'm glad to see it. It's about time somebody took an interest in us besides Bobby Thebold and his leftover lightnings. The B-58 closed rapidly the last few miles between them, banked and circled Superior. "'Attention, people of Superior,' a voice from the plane said. The magnified words reached them distinctly through the cold air. "'Inasmuch as you are now leaving the continental United States, this aircraft has been assigned to accompany you. From this point on you are under the protection of the United States Air Force.' "'That's better,' Don said. "'It's not much, but at least somebody's doing something. The B-58 streaked off and took up a course in a vast circle around them. I'm not sure I like having it around, Alice said. I mean, suppose they find out that Superior's controlled by, I don't know, let's say a foreign power or an alien race. Once we're out over the Atlantic where nobody else could get hurt, wouldn't they maybe consider it a small sacrifice to wipe out Superior to get rid of the, the alien? Don, looked at her closely. What's this about an alien? What do you know? I don't know anything. It's just the feeling I have, that this is bigger than Father and Mare Civic and all the self-important VIPs in Superior put together. She squeezed his arm as if to draw comfort from him. Maybe it's seeing the ocean and realizing the vastness of it, but for the first time I'm beginning to feel a little scared. I won't say there's nothing to be afraid of, Don said. He pulled her hand through his arm. It isn't as though this were a precedented situation. But whatever's going on, remember there are some pretty good people on our side, too. I know, she said, and you're one of them. He wondered what she meant by that. Nothing, probably, except thank you for the reassurance. He decided that was it. The mechanical eavesdropper he wore under his collar was making him too self-conscious. He tried to think of something appropriate to say to her that he wouldn't mind having overheard in the Pentagon. Nothing occurred to him, so he drew Alice closer and gave her a quick, quiet kiss. The crowd of people looking over the edge had grown. Judging by their number, few people were in school or at their jobs today. Yesterday they had seemed only mildly interested in what their town was up to, but today, with the North American continent about to be left behind, they were paying more attention. Yet Don could see no signs of alarm on their faces. At most there was a reflection of wonder, but not much more than there might be among a group of Europeans seeing New York Harbor from shipboard for the first time. An apathetic bunch, he decided, who would be resigned to their situation so long as their usual pattern of their lives was not interfered with unduly. What they lacked, of course, was leadership. "'It's big, isn't it?' Alice said. She was looking at the Atlantic, which was virtually the only thing left to see except the bright blue sky, a strip of the New England coast, and the circling bomber. "'It's going to get bigger,' Don said. 
Shall we go across town and take a last look at the States? He also wanted to see what, if anything, was going on in town. Not the last, I hope. I'd prefer a round trip. An enterprising cab driver opened his door for them. Special excursion rate to the West End, he said. One buck. You're on, said Don. How's business? Not what you call booming. No trains to meet, no buses. Hi, Alice. This isn't one of your father's brainstorms come to life, is it? Hi, Chuck, she said. I seriously doubt it, though I'm sure you'd never get him to admit it. How are your wife and the boy? Fine, that boy, he's got some imagination. He's digging a hole in the back yard. Last week he told us he was getting close to China. This week it's Australia. He said at supper last night that they must have heard about this hole and started digging from the other end. They've connected up, according to him, and he had quite a conversation with the kangaroo. A kangaroo? Don sat up straight. Yeah, you know how kids are. I guess he's studying Australia in geography. What did the kangaroo tell your son? The cab driver laughed defensively. There's nothing wrong with the boy. He's just got an active mind. Of course, when I was a kid I used to talk to bears. But what did he say the kangaroo talked about? Oh, just crazy stuff. Like the kangaroos didn't like it down under any more and were coming up here because it was safer. Later that morning, at about the time Don Port estimated that Superior had passed the twelve-mile limit, east from the coast not up, the Superior State Bank was held up. A man clearly recognized as Joe Negus, a small-time gambler, and one other man had driven up to the bank in Negus flashy Buick convertible. They walked up to the head teller, threatened him with pistols, and demanded all the money in all the tills. They stuffed the bills in a sack, got into their car, and drove off. They took nothing from the customers and made no attempt to take anything from the vault. The fact that they ignored the vault made Don feel better. He thought when he first heard about the robbery that the men might have been after the briefcase he'd stored there, which would have meant that he was under suspicion. But apparently the job was a genuine heist, not a cover-up for something else. Police Chief Vincent Gran reached the scene half an hour after the criminals left it. His car had frozen up and wouldn't start. He arrived by taxi, red-faced, fingering the butt of his holster service automatic. Negus and his confederate, identified as a pool-room lounger named Hank Stacy, had gotten away with a hundred thousand dollars. I didn't know there was that much money in town, was Gran's comment on that. While he was asking other questions, the telephone rang, and someone told the bank president he'd seen Negus and Stacy go into the pool room. In fact, the robber's convertible was parked blatantly in front of the place. Grant, looking as if he'd rather be dogcatcher, got back into the taxi. Joe Negus and Hank Stacy were sitting on opposite sides of a pool table when the police chief got there, dividing the money in three piles. A third man stood by, watching closely. He was Jerry Lynch, a lawyer. He greeted Grand. "'Morning, Vince,' he said easily. "'Come to shoot a little pool?' "'I'll shoot some bank robbers if they don't hand over that money,' Grand said. He had his gun out and looked almost purposeful. Negus and Stacy made no attempt to go for their guns. Stacy seemed nervous, but Negus went on counting the money without looking up. "'Is it your money, Vince?' Jerry Lynch asked. "'You know damn well whose money it is. Now let's have it.' "'I'm afraid I couldn't do that,' the lawyer said. "'In the first place, I wouldn't want to, thirty-three and a third percent of it being mine. And in the second place, you have no authority.' "'I'm the chief of police,' Grand said doggedly. "'I don't want to spill any blood.' "'Don't flash your badge at me, Vince,' Lynch said. Negus had finished counting the money, and the lawyer took one of the piles and put it in various pockets. I said you had no authority. Bank robbery is a federal offense. Not that I admit there's been a robbery, but if you suspect a crime it's your duty to go to the proper authorities. The FBI would be indicated if you know where they can be reached. Yeah, Joe Negus said. Go take a fly and jump for yourself, Chief. Listen, you cheap crook. Hardly cheap, Vince, Lynch said, and not even a crook in my professional opinion. Mr. Negus pleads extra-territoriality. That was the start of Superior's crime wave. 
somebody broke the plate glass window of George Tucker's dry goods store and got away with blankets, half a dozen overcoats, and several sets of woolen underwear. A fuel oil truck disappeared from the street outside of Daphne Brothers and was found abandoned in the morning. About nine hundred gallons had been drained out, as if someone had filled his cellar tank and a couple of his neighbors. The back door of the supermarket was forced, and somebody made off with a variety of groceries. The missing goods would have just about filled one car. Each of these crimes was understandable. Superiors growing food and fuel shortage and icy temperatures had led a few people to desperation. But there were other incidents. Somebody smashed a window at Kembro's jewelry store and snatched a display of medium-priced watches. Half a dozen young vandals sneaked into the Catholic Church and began toppling statues of the saints. When they were surprised by Father Brian they fled, bombarding him with prayer books. One of the books shattered a stained-glass window depicting Christ dispensing loaves and fishes. Somebody started a fire in the movie house balcony and nearly caused a panic. Vincent Graham rushed from place to place investigating, but rarely learned enough to make an arrest. The situation was becoming unpleasant. Superior had always been a friendly place to live, where everyone knew everyone else, at least to say hello to, but now there was suspicion and fear, not to mention increasing cold and threatened famine. Everyone was cheered up, therefore, when Mayor Hector Civic announced a mass meeting in Town Square. Bonfires were lit, and the reviewing stand that was used for the annual Founder's Day Parade was hauled out as a speaker's platform. Civic was late. The crowd bundled up against the cold was stamping their feet and beginning to shout a bit when he arrived. There was a medium-sized cheer as the mayor climbed to the platform. "'Fellow citizens,' he began, then stopped the search through his overcoat pockets. "'Well,' he went on, "'I guess I put the speech in an inside pocket, and it's too cold to look for it. I know what it says, anyway. This brought a few laughs. Don Court stood near the edge of the crowd and watched the people around him. They mostly had a no-nonsense look about them, as if they were not going to be satisfied with more oratory. Civic said, I'm not going to keep you standing in the cold and tell you what you already know, how our food supplies are dwindling, how we're using up our stocks of coal and fuel oil with no immediate hope of replacement. You know all that. We sure do, Hector, somebody called out. Yes, so, as I say, I'm not going to talk about what the problem is. We don't need words. We need action. He paused as if he expected a cheer or applause, but the crowd merely waited for him to go on. If Superior had been hit by a flood or a tornado, Civic said, we could look to the Red Cross and the state or federal government for help. But we've been the victims of a far greater misfortune torn from the bosom of Mother Earth and flung. Oh, come on, Hector, an old woman said. We're getting froze. I'm sorry about that, Mrs. Potts, Civic said. You should be home where it's warm. We ran out of coal for the furnace, and now we're running out of logs. Are you going to do something about that? I tell you what I'm going to do, Mrs. Potts, for you and all the other wonderful people here tonight. We're going to put a stop to this lawlessness we never had before. We're going to make Superior a place to be proud of. Superior has changed, risen, you might say, to a new status. We're more than a town now. We're free and separate, not only from Ohio, but from the United States. We're a sovereign place, a, a sovereignty, and we need new methods to cope with new conditions, to restore law and order, to see that all our subjects, our citizen subjects, are provided for. The crowd had become hushed as Civic neared his point. To that noble end, Civic went on, I dedicate myself, and I take this momentous step and hereby proclaim the existence of the kingdom of Superior. He paused to take a deep breath, and proclaim myself its first king. He stopped. His oratory had carried him to a climax, and he didn't quite know where to go from there. Maybe he expected cheers to carry him over, but none came. There was complete silence except for the crackling of the bonfires. But after a moment there was a shuffling of feet and a whispering that grew to a murmur. Then out of the murmur came derisive shouts and catcalls. King Hector I, somebody hooted, long live the king. 
The words could have been gratifying, but the tone of voice was all wrong. "'Where's Hector's crown?' somebody else cried. "'Hey, Jack, did you forget to bring the crown?' "'Yeah,' Jack said. "'I forgot, but I got a rope over my truck. We could elevate him that way.' Jack was obviously joking, but a group of men in another part of the crowd pushed toward the platform. "'Yeah,' one of them said. "'Let's string him up. A woman at the back of the crowd screamed. Two hairy figures about five feet tall appeared from the darkness. They were kangaroo-like, with long tails. No one tried to stop them, and the creatures reached the platform and pulled Hector down. They placed him between them, and then, their way clear now, began to hop away. Their hops grew longer as they reached the edge of the square. Their leaps had become prodigious as they disappeared in the direction of North Lake, Civic in his heavy coat looking almost like one of them. Don Court couldn't tell whether the creatures were kidnapping Civic or rescuing him. Chapter 8 Hector Civic had been found by the time Judge Helms' court convened at 10 a.m. Joe Negus was there, wearing a new suit and looking confident. His confederate, Hank Stacy, was obviously trying to achieve the same poise, but not succeeding. Jerry Lynch, their lawyer, was talking to Ed Clark. Don Court took a seat the editor had saved for him in the front row. Alice Garrett came in and sat next to him. I cut my sociology class, she told him. Anybody find His Majesty yet? No, Don said. Who gave him that crackpot idea? He's had big ideas ever since he ran for the state assembly. He got licked then, but this is the first time he's been kidnapped, or should it be kanganapped? Poor Hector, I shouldn't joke about it. Judge Helms, who was really a justice of the peace, came in through a side door and the clerk banged his gavel. But the business of the court did not get under way immediately. Someone burst in from the street and shouted, He's back! Civic's back! The people at the rear of the room rushed out to see. In a moment they were crowding back in behind Hector Civic's grand entrance. Oh, no, Alice said. Don't tell me he made it this time. Civic was wearing the trappings of royalty. He walked with dignity down the aisle, an ermine robe on his shoulders, a crown on his head, and a scepter in his right hand. He nodded benignly about him. "'Good morning, Judge,' he said. To the clerk he said, "'Frank, see to our horses, will you?' "'Horses?' the clerk said, blinking. "'Our royal coach is without, and the horses need attending to,' Civic said patiently. "'You don't think a king walks, do you?' The clerk went out, puzzled. Judge Helms took off his pince-nez and regarded the spectacle of Hector Civic in ermine. "'What is all this, Hector?' he asked. "'You weren't serious about that king business, were you? Nice to see you back safe, by the way. We would prefer to be addressed the first time as Your Majesty, Judge,' Civic said. "'After that you can call us sir.' "'Us?' the judge asked. "'Somebody with you?' "'The royal we,' Civic said. I see I'll have to issue a proclamation on the proper forms of address. I mean, we'll have to. Takes a bit of getting used to, doesn't it? Quite a bit, the judge agreed. But right now, if you don't mind, this court is in session and has a case before it. Suppose you make your royal self comfortable and we'll get on with it as soon as my clerk is back from attending to the royal horses. The clerk returned and whispered in the judge's ear. Helms looked at Civic and shook his head. Six of them, eh? I'll have a look later. Right now we've got a bank robbery case on the calendar. Vincent Graham talked, and Jerry Lynch talked, and Judge Helms listened and looked up statutes and pursed his lips thoughtfully. Joe Negus cleaned his nails. Hank Stacy bit his. Finally the judge said, I hate to admit this, but I'm afraid I must agree with you, counselor. The alleged crime contravened no local statute, and in the absence of a representative of the federal government, 
I must regretfully dismiss the charges. Joe Nagus promptly got up and began to walk out. Just a minute there, varlet. It was Hector Civic doing his king bit. Negus, who probably had been called everything else in his life, paused and looked over his shoulder. Approach, Civic thundered. Nuts, your kingship, Negus said. Nobody stops me now. But before he got to the door, something stopped him in mid-stride. Civic had pointed his scepter at Negus in that instant. Negus, stiff as a stop-action photograph, toppled to the floor. Now, Civic said, motioning to Judge Helms to vacate the bench, will dispense some royal justice. He sat down, arranging his robes and shifting his heavy crown. Mr. Counselor Lynch, we take it you represent the defendants? Yes, Your Majesty, said the lawyer, an adaptable man. What happened to Negus, sir? Is he dead? He could have been, if we'd given him another notch. No, he's just suspended. Let him be an example to anyone else who might incur our royal wrath. Now, Counselor, we are familiar enough with the case to render an impartial verdict. We find the defendants guilty of bank robbery. But, Your Majesty, Lynch said, bank robbery is not a crime under the laws of Superior. I submit that there has been no crime, inasmuch as the incident occurred after Superior became detached from Earth, and therefore from its laws. There is the King's Law, Civic said. We decree bank robbery a crime, together with all other offenses against the county, state, and country, which are not specifically covered in Superior's statutes. Retroactively? Lynch asked. Of course. We will now pronounce sentence. First, restitution of the money, except for ten percent to the King's bench. Second, indefinite paralysis for Negus. We'll straighten out his arms and legs so he'll take up less room. Third, probation for Hank Stacy here, with a warning to him to stay out of bad company. Courts adjourned. Civic wouldn't say where he got the costume or the coach and six or the paralyzing scepter. He refused to say where the two kangaroo-like creatures had taken him. He allowed his ermine to be fingered, holding the scepter out of reach, talked vaguely about better times to come now that Superior was a monarchy then ordered his coach. By royal decree, Hank Stacy, who had been inching toward the door, became royal coachman, commanded to serve out his probation in the king's custody. Stacy drove Civic home. No one seemed to remember who had been at the reins when the coach first appeared. End of chapter 8 Recording by Tom Weiss Tom's Audiobooks.com